Hello Level 4s, welcome back. Last lesson, we looked at a business proposal. A lot of talking, too much information I gave you. Now, this week, this day, or in this lesson, I would like to start with an exercise. You can look at this as a pressy form of. So a little bit of grammar, but you will learn something about a business proposal and also you will learn the art of doing a pressy. Now, if you could do this in one minute, it's not going to take you long. I have underlined some of the words that you're going to use. This, remember, we also look at it in paper one as part of grammar. So a mixture of grammar and a little bit of business proposal will help you. So take one minute starting now. I am sure that one minute is up and you did not find it difficult because you're just looking at answers. Let's compare your answers to mine. There you have it. And if you read this, it's a very interesting piece which is talking about what you're going to do. It's a mixture of implementation plan, a mixture of what you would do in a business proposal, what you have going and what you do not have going. The problem with level four, there's a lot of writing. And occasionally, if you don't practice, you will never know what to do. That is why I'm giving you exercises so that you may practice and have an idea of what is expected of you. Let me guess you got 10 out of 10 and maybe 8 out of 10 but if you got below 5 oh that's a problem and I hope you just did not look at that you also read through the topic now moving along another one that you might have to write with an opinion is letters to the press letters to the press are always addressed to the newspaper, sometimes the magazine. Why would you write a letter to the press? We always write a letter to the press because it is something that is worrying us. Or you have found something in your community that doesn't really sit right and you know no one else knows, except for your community, but you want the whole world to know. If not the whole world, at least you want the whole nation and other provinces to know and other communities. Why would you do that? Because you want them to compare. You want them to think also. Remember we said, every time we write with an opinion, what are we trying to do? We are trying to persuade people to see it differently, to have a little bit of a thought, to actually look and see that their beliefs are not shared only by them. So, letters to the editor. A few things are important. So, as usual, we shall always start from the factual point of view. So, when we write, we write from what we have seen that is happening. That is factual language. And all the time you write, remember, we are commenting and we are sharing a one-sided opinion. Members of the public can also use this platform because they want to reply to you, respond to you, or share with you some of those things that you have seen. So when you write, remember this letter is public. This letter goes to everybody who's going to read it. Can you imagine a, 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 um, if you go on Facebook, for example, sorry about that, and you post it out there. 
remember many people are going to read it that's the public and then you must be prepared as well for the criticism you must be prepared for people to comment on it you must be prepared for people to respond to you so if you are going to be one that comes across a letter like that and you want to respond what should you have in mind you must always remember that if for starters the letter you read did not have a name most of the times letters without names are never published letters without knowing who actually wrote are never published why do we need to write our names we write our names because we need to be able to identify with that person who wrote that letter so if you're responding you will be able also to address that person say it was jane that wrote this letter you want to say dear jane in response to your letter remember as well it goes public now, the other thing to be careful about is something we call pseudonymy. When you write a letter, we always finish with a pseudonymy. What do I mean by a pseudonymy? Let's say for argument's sake, we are going to go back to our recycling. You have looked around your community, you have found there's a lot of littering. And you're worried about this littering because probably safety of the children that are playing around. You are worried about the air that we breathe. We are worried about the kind of litter that is out there. Because you see, let's face it, when people litter, they don't care what they're littering and they don't care where they're dumping it. So you would be writing about this littering because you want people to know about it. And every time you write a letter, just don't be a person who complains. It is always good to add a solution or maybe a thought so that other people could be able to help you and share with you. So what is a pseudonymy? If I am writing about this recycling, when I finish, I will say or talk words like concerned community member, caring community member, worried community member. Maybe I'll call myself a mother of a three-year-old community member. So those words, worrying, community member, caring community member, concerned, angry. Those are the words that we call pseudonymy. And just because you put a pseudonymy doesn't mean you don't give your name. Because if you don't, they will not publish your letter. Now, few things to look out for. When you write and you write this, a few things that you need to worry about are this. Every time you write, I've tried to gather a few for you here, some tips. Make use of the subjective language. Every time you tap into people's emotions, that is why we give a pseudonymy. Because if you look at it as a pseudonymy, if you say I'm worried, what does that mean? That is an emotive language or an emotive word. And then you should be able to have historical questions. Remember what I said in the previous lessons. Historical questions are powerful because you allow the public to think and to question and to identify with you because they draw the attention of many people. The other thing that you need to do is to be able to express your point of view very politely. Some of us are very opinionated and then they put their emotions through and then without realizing, they, they become insulting. They abuse people, they become name callers because they call people names and they start wondering and forget that this letter is going to be read by many. Unfortunately, even the young people might read it. Who do I mean young people? A 10 year old might capture that newspaper and read. And then the last one is that you write in a way that it creates a persuasive response. When you write, make sure that your letter when people read it they will be persuaded to help you. They will be persuaded to agree with you. They will be persuaded to look for sponsors, look for scholarship, uh, uh, ways of helping you. So have a note of that. Another thing to look out for is a few of these ones. Use the format of a letter. This is strictly for exam. They always give you pointers of how to use and what to use. Use a suitable subject line. I cannot stress that hard enough. A suitable subject line is very important. Don't just write. That goes hand in hand with the title. The reason people will read your work, publish your work, respond to you, evoke emotion, 
is because you have got a suitable title. Let me give you an example. Remember that KFC gentleman who proposed to the wife? It, this, in this case, it was a video. And then there's somebody who wrote something in laughter. What did it evoke? It evoked wonderful emotions. They got sponsorship from all over the place. Why? We couldn't say that he had a suitable title or a suitable line or a suitable comment, but we could say that he evoked people's emotions and persuaded the audience to do something about it because the man was genuine. Another person was finding it very funny. All in all, a few of those things you can read, but above all, include a very good, strong conclusion. That always take the icing of the cake. If you have a beautiful conclusion, I want to give you a challenge. I want us to read this letter that was written by Sanele Mdladla. This extract is quite a short piece, but it will give us an idea of how to write letters. Now, I know you are fast readers, and even if you're not a fast reader, it's not a big piece. We are going to take one minute and read it and then we shall work out the answers from there. Why do I want us to do it? Because I know we shall learn a few, one thing or two about how to answer a question. That one minute is starting now. I am sure your one minute is up and you were able to browse very quickly, skim through it. Now, we are going to try and answer questions and the questions that I have will interweave with other lessons that we have been speaking about, like emotive language, point of views, and then we have an addition of something that has been added explicit and implicit. The other thing I would like is to let's look at the questions together. That always helps. The first question, find one example of a fact in the letter and one example of an opinion. Question number two, find an example of subjective, which is emotive language in the letter, and an example of objective language. And then with that, you're going to give, two, you're going to give reasons for your choices. And also take note of the marks. The marks are four marks. You don't get marks for just saying it is an emotive language. You get marks because of all those other reasons. Moving along, what is this writer's point of view? You see what we were saying. Every time a writer writes, they have a point of view. And that point of view, they hope that you can capture it yourself. And then give a reason for your answer. Then number four, what assumptions is the writer making about the situation in schools? Now, those assumptions are not easy to find, but we shall figure it out together. The last two, what is her explicit message? And the next one, what is her implicit message? Explicit and implicit, implicit I'm sure you heard before in the term one. But explicit just means clearly what is the writer stipulating? Implicit is not quite clearly stipulated, but we can figure it out if we read one or two sentences. That is exactly what it means. Now, starting with the first answer, find one example of a fact in the letter and one example of an opinion. Let's quickly jump there. There we go. That is our story. If you read it, Quick, quick, I'm sure as you read, you will find the answer. Remember, objective, 
and subjective. By now you know what those words stand for. And I'm going to go to my answers very quickly so that you may we find it easier to find it. There we go. The first one. As an opinion or a fact for obtaining 77.4 pass rate in the 2013 metric. That is clear facts. That's exactly what happened. If you look at the opinion, opinion is they made us proud as citizens of KwaZulu Natal. Now, not everybody might be proud. Now, here is one of our sentences. This is where our sentence lies. There we go. I'm going to highlight it so that you may see. And by the end of this, we might have a lot of highlighted places. There is our 77 pass rate in the 2013 metric. And then the other one, I'm just going to use another color so that you may see. It is, they made us proud made as proud. It still took the same color, but it doesn't matter. So those are the two that stand out as the ones that we should answer. Okay, we are going to do a little bit of moving back and forth, but I hope that you'll be learning. Question number two, find an example of subjective emotive language in the letter and an example of objective language. Okay? Right, that almost ties together because fact goes with objective and opinion go with subjective. So let's see if we can find those two. Quickly, let's go back there and see. Do you think you can find besides these two? Which other ones do you think stand out as objective and subjective? Every time you, write a piece, you read a piece, it's got quite a lot of them. This story is long and it has got enough information for all of us. Now, Look for another that is objective and another that is subjective. I'll give you 30 seconds, but because you read it, I know you already have it. Found it? Let's compare your answer to mine. There we go. The subjective one will be teaching and learning will definitely have started on the very first day of the school calendar without any challenges. Why would I say using any challenges? The challenges and the definitely, it pulls that this person is positive, it's showing a positive thing. And also the challenges is giving a positive word of how they are going to source all these things. Let's find the 99, the distribution of 99. We already have it, the textbooks there and stationary delivered. Commended and stationary shall be confirmed, commended. There we go. Why did it take so long to find it? There we go, we found it. And you can see definitely that's the word we were talking about and have started the calendar year with the challenges. Now that is a subjective one. We are all there. Now the objective one will be the 99% of the books have been delivered and the stationary. That is the next one that we are going to have. It's not looking very neat, but it's giving you the idea so that we don't repeat and it's going to be quicker. Now, let's go to the third um, question. Now, the third question is asking, what is this writer's viewpoint? And give a reason for the writer's viewpoint. Where are you going to find her viewpoint? You have to finish the reading to be able to know her viewpoint. So let me give you a few seconds to find it. And then we shall compare it to my answers. By now the reading is becoming easier because we have highlighted quite a lot. Let's compare the answers. Consider that objective. So the writer's viewpoint, there it goes, where it begins from KwaZulu Natal Department of Education needs to be commended for their performance. And then teachers and learners for their hard work 
That is also another one that we are going to. She's commending the teachers for their hard work. She's commending the Department of Education for their delivery. So that is her viewpoint, that they're doing a good job. Does everybody else agree? It's to be questioned. So all that you will find it here. There, the KwaZulu Natal Education Department needs to be commended, okay? But that's for their outperforming work. So we can highlight that and put it in green, okay? Or blue. Let me just use the pen, it's faster. There we go. They need to be commended. And obviously, the efforts of the teachers for their hard work. Now you can see that our story is finishing off. I bet our time is quickly running out. So I'm just going to straight away jump to question five and six. Question five and six says, what is her explicit, the assumptions, we shall look at them just now. What are the assumptions? And then what is her explicit message and implicit message? Let's jump straight to my answers. If you look at question four, the assumption is that she anticipates that there will be no problem. She's assuming that everything will go well in 2014. Why? Because 2013 was not a problem. But now when we look at what is the, her explicit message, she is emphasizing that there must be further improvement. She's doubting no problems with having improvement. She is foreseeing that 2014 will be definitely much better than 2015. How about the implicit? She is also a little bit having, is improvement really possible? Yes, she's believing that improvement is possible. But how would this improvement work if parents and teachers cooperate by encouraging learners as well to learn? So this is quite a very long and um, Comprehension, but I hope that I have shown you ways of looking at a comprehension and answering the questions. Now let's jump quickly in conclusion. One thing before I, we can jump into conclusion, I would like to request you to take this challenge and write a letter to your local newspaper and have a nice subject that you're going to be talking about. Remember, we are writing with an opinion. Whose opinion? Your own opinion only and let it be something that will ignite a question, will ignite persuasion from the other communities to be able to answer. And don't forget to use a pseudonymy. Caring community member or worried community member and your name. Just to conclude, before we close this lesson, I would like to quickly touch on report, uh, writing a report argumentatively. That stems from the word argument. Remember we talked about argument. Whenever we have pieces that are written, sometimes they're there to argue out something. So when you have an argumentative report, your viewpoints will definitely differ when you explain them. You will have your viewpoint and then you will bring of other people so that it is almost like a debate that you're writing down. So an argumentative report is not a difficult one to write as long as you remember to incorporate the other person's point of view. Now to do this, first and foremost, you must investigate what you're going to be writing about or what you'll be arguing about. Don't just write about it. You collect data, you evaluate points, and then you put them together and you start questioning. That is why you would have the other people's point of view. Then you have beautiful logical connectors. By now, you know how to write beautiful pieces. And remember, the rule still stands. Don't write more than four paragraphs, not more. Where you need to talk more is in the two, the body. But have words like consequently, in the meantime, similarly, at the same time. And that is when you're bringing the other person's argument or point of view, we would use this to be able to contract. Uh, to be able to compare and contrast. So argumentative pieces are interesting because it shows that you incorporate everybody. Finally, just for you to be able to have this in mind is just to take a few things that you could take note of. 
The other one is a reflective piece, an argumentative one. We argue and pull things together. A reflective piece is my favorite. I love reading reflective pieces. Why? Reflective pieces, they share personal experiences. Whether good or bad, they are beautiful pieces to read because people write from the heart. And I must say, this is one piece that level fours you are very good at writing. I don't know whether because it is your personal experience, but you write it beautifully. Don't forget, have your own opinion. But the most interesting thing about these personal pieces, try to use as many descriptive words as possible. Emotive language, how you felt, how it made you feel, how you felt when everybody else was looking at you or not responding and so many others. We don't use so many facts, we use emotions. We have one fact, and that one fact is the experience, the good or the bad, but we put a lot of emotions. But when you're coming to finish this piece, again, in our four paragraphs, that fourth paragraph, you need to add, how was that experience for you? Was it an experience that taught you a lesson? Was it an experience that you came to a realization about your strength, about your power, about how people view things? There are so many things that you could bring. So it's not only about a lesson learned, but also a realization that might have come. So I hope that I have been able to give you an overview of writing. I know it's a lot of talking and a lot of listening, but with all this, if only you could remember one thing and one thing only, we are airing our views, whether it is our own view, in the case of reflective piece, articles and editorials and columns, or an argumentative piece where you share other people's opinions. We will see you in the next lesson when we have the last two lessons for the day. Bye.